Hi there, um, Sean. Welcome to uh, the uh, the online uh, interview. Um, really nice to to sort of have you with us today. Um, looking forward to having a conversation with you. But uh, thought it might be a good idea just to have a, a brief introduction of, of yourself, your role, uh, and and sort of what it is you're doing. Hi, I'm Sean Hunter. I'm the CIO of Ugnor. Wonderful. Um, and maybe a little bit of, uh, obviously, you know, Oak North Bank, for, for me, very well-known, very recognisable brand. Maybe give us a little bit of an overview of, of who Oak North Bank are, where you sort of started and where you came from. Sure. So Oak North is an interesting company in that it's a bank in the UK and a fintech platform everywhere else in the world. Our goal is to use tech plus data plus people to solve the problem of SME lending globally. So we think SME lending is broken. You know, banks approach to it has been sort of rigid and bureaucratic and unchanged for quite a long time. And we want to use a modern approach to do that, uh, to fix that problem. So we, in the UK, we started a bank about five years ago. Um, it's been very, very successful, focused specifically on SMEs. Um, and then outside the UK, we use the platform which we developed um, for the UK bank to help other banks address the exact same need because this is a global problem yeah absolutely so to just sort of talking a little bit about obviously the you know COVID-19 and the reaction what did what did Oak North and yourselves do in sort of the initial phases and what you're doing now to actually sort of protect yourself and and your employees yeah so it's I mean it's really important to realize as a bank that everything you knew before the crisis is kind of redundant um, and you need to re-underwrite your whole credit book um, because historical data, historic analysis, risk ratings you had before, et cetera, are more or less completely broken, including all previous correlations. So a lot of things that you thought were true are no longer um, assumptions you can rely on in the new world. So this is where our expertise and our use of data really comes to the fore. So in the bank in the UK, we started in January when the crisis began, just analyzing all of our borrowers are looking for international supply chain disruption and you know, businesses with particular exposures to, for example, Wuhan in China, um, somewhere in their supply chain. Because initially, everyone was thinking about this as a, as a China-based crisis. As the, the crisis evolved and we moved into more of a lockdown, um, we were more concerned about you know, the complete absence of demand in the economy and the effect that would have on businesses. And so we started to run reverse tests, reverse stress tests based on a, a lot of, we've got about 34 sector specific uh, COVID scenarios. And we ran all these stress tests across all of our borrowers to see which ones you know, were actually at risk. And that was the genesis of our CVR or COVID vulnerability rating, which basically looks at the impact uh, for a business if there was a six week lockdown followed by reviews of, you know, three, six, even nine month long lockdowns and how that would impact businesses. And then we used that framework to target which businesses needed immediate support. Um, because, you know, there's a huge difference between a business that is, you know, able to really reduce costs, um, you know, basically put the whole business into hibernation versus a business that still has ongoing cost, even though there's no revenue coming in. And so, you're really looking at what is the ability of these businesses to weather this crisis and then what do they need in order to re reboot their business afterwards? Uh, you're on mute, I think. Sorry, yeah. I was going to say, it's been sort of a really interesting sort of time um, over, over that sort of period from, you know, when lockdown started in the UK from sort of first, second week of March through to now. Um, obviously, one of the advantages that you, you had as a business was that you're able to react quite quickly. Um, to the sort of changing pace of things. And is that kind of how this um, uh, COVID vulnerability rating sort of got formed from, from sort of your learnings as you progressed? Yeah, so, I mean, we believe very strongly in the power of momentum. And, you know, the, the benefit of moving fast is that you get to continue to move fast. Uh, and so we were already accustomed to developing new ideas and taking them to market very quickly. Um, and obviously the bank, gives us the ability to, to do that because we have our own barbaras we can analyze and so on. So as a platform business, we're able to use that um, as a sort of a test case for new things like the CVR. Um, the, the 
the benefit of one of the big benefits of our bank in the UK is we were already monitoring our borrowers in a different way compared to normal banks. Um, a much more, um, you know, much more frequent contact with the borrowers, um, much more detailed financial information and analysis. So because we'd already built that foundation, um, we were able to just adapt that a little bit to build out this, this CVR framework. Interesting. Um, and sort of thinking a little bit about sort of the, the sort of loan book that you had. Um, and I remember quite clearly one of the, um, the, the first statement uh, that Oak North uh, came out with when they were accredited as a C-bills lender, um, the Corona, you know, business interruption loan scheme. I should mm -hmm. explain the criteria because, you know, maybe some people haven't heard about it yet. Um, but one of the very first things you came out is that you really had decided that you were going to prioritize um, your sort of existing customers um, and, and use that appropriately. Was that part of the, the sort of the findings as well? And, and you'd use this, um, what now we're going to call the COVID vulnerability rating to, to sort of predict that was what you needed to do? Um, it, it definitely predicted, it sort of definitely informed our strategy of how we were going to tackle um, our existing book, which borrowers we thought needed additional capital um, and CVILS is obviously one of those things, um, you know, there are also things like, uh, you know, interest payment holidays and so on that, that you can offer borrowers. Um, you know, one of the things that we're, we're able to do is use a very analytical data-driven approach um, because we've built this sector framework where we can differentiate between the um, different sectors that businesses are in and, and what the impact of the crisis is having on those different uh, sectors. It allows us to be much more uh, surgical in terms of how we approach things and treat each borrower individually. So whereas, you know, if you're a massive bank, you're probably just taking a sector by sector view and saying, I want to completely shut down this one sector. I want to go and help people in a different sector or whatever. We're able to, you know, really address each individual borrower and look at how the crisis is affecting them and then, you know, how we think it's going to play out uh, on the broader scale. And that really informed our opinions. And so we're still doing new lending, not just in the in the CBIL scheme. We're still doing new lending uh, to businesses because they're still businesses, good businesses, you need capital and so on. Um, and and uh, we will continue to, you know, look to support those businesses. But, you know, in the CBIL scheme as well, we, we got a small allocation, which was, which was uh, I think, 36 million We've already um, approved, uh, know, so we had 50 million. We've approved 36 of our 50 so far. And we're going to be looking for additional funds because we think there's a lot of um, businesses that need support under this kind of program. Um, and, and yeah, so we, we're still, you know, looking on it on a, on a continuous basis uh, to yeah. see what can be done. Okay. I mean, there's, there's a couple of things that I want to pull out from, from what you just said. The, the first one being obviously uh, the fact that, you know, your, your business is, is not purely now just lending C-bills uh, and, and focusing on that area. Obviously, the business is presumably uh, hesitant to use the word normal, but you're, you're running a, a traditional uh, revenue uh, model and lending model alongside your, your coronavirus. Can you give us a feel for what sort of the, the, the difference is, what the balance between the two are? Um, yeah, so I mean, I think since the lockdown began, we've done 36 million of CBELs loans, we've approved over 60 million of normal, so to speak, new lending. Mm -hmm. um, now, that that's, you know, definitely there is an impact from um, the coronavirus and so on, on the pace of new lending, and 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 so on. But we are still continuing to lend. I think one of the things that you know we believe really strongly in the power of SMEs and the importance of SMEs to the economy globally. And if you think uh, you know we're going to have to reboot the economy when this crisis passes, it's really SMEs that are going to be the powerhouse of that. And so we want to um, you know look for strong businesses that we can support uh, to help them to do that. Yeah, and it's kind of the, the interesting uh, second point I want to take out what you said previously was obviously uh, around the the sort of the allocation. 
-hmm. Now, I think um, not very many people realized that each of the accredited lenders was having an allocation. Um, there was actually a couple of stories that were bro broken recently, which are sort of maybe suggesting that some of the reason why some other um, banks such as Starling um, and uh, Funding Circle are not quite lending quite as much as they want is that they've got various different limits. I think Tide mm -hmm. was mentioned in, in that as well. How do you see that? Was, was that a, um, an area which you were obviously, you were obviously given this limit by uh, the British Business Bank? Is that something that you see was, was integral into making sure that the monies were delivered in the right way? Or, or what was your sort of take on, on that sort of needing an allocation? Yeah, so, I mean, I think it's, it's difficult, right? Because I think government organizations and sort of quasi-government organizations like the BBB you know, are not set up to move quickly. They, they're sort of intrinsically designed to be prudent with public funds and, and so on. And so I think getting accredited is hard. Getting a allocation is difficult. Um, I know that, you know, established banks got far larger allocations than we did. And it's, it's somewhat um, counterintuitive in the sense that, you know, some of these new lenders such as ourselves, uh, the other ones you mentioned, Starling Tide and so on, um, are probably set up to move a little quicker in terms of actually getting the funds into the economy. However, I can understand the BBB wanting to be prudent and make sure these these loans are done in a in a you know in a prudent manner or whatever. In a responsible way, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so and so I understand the trade-off. But for us, um, you know, I do think it would have been helpful to have a larger allocation. Obviously we're we're grateful for the allocation we have, but you know. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting point. And, um, you know, we've discussed this or I've discussed this on numerous uh, webinars and various other platforms with a lot of the, the players that I just mentioned. Also, along with uh, NatWest, um, mm -hmm. obviously Royal Bank of Scotland uh, uh, staff as well, um, that actually kind of kind of agreed. To it. And it, it kind of is an interesting point where I don't think, you know, the banks involved in this were actually... Uh, part of the problem they, they were obviously trying to be a part of the solution and it did kind of feel like that the, the banks were trying to take this because uh, obviously the, the C bills program is based loosely on uh, a previous government support screen that was designed maybe to, to underwrite sort of you know something ridiculously low like a, you know 10 million pounds worth of, of loans over five years or, or something mm -hmm. like that that's not the exact figures but um, and so it wasn't quite fit for purpose and what they tried to do very quickly was to sort of change that and, and work along with it um and and sort of that west were kind of like talking us through that sort of process of allocations trying to understand how to how to work how to make the system do what it wants and there was a lot of there was a lot of frustration for the fintech community which knew that fintechs and companies like yourselves and starling and tide were able to deploy money so much faster than the the high street lenders but as with everything that the time it takes for sort of government organizations and everything to, to actually, um, you know, react and to change systems is, is quite small. Some, some will say, uh, actually, the amount of time they've had to change and have started changing is, is quite impressive for a government organization, which is never yeah. designed to run at that yeah. sort of speed anyway. Um, so, so it's quite an interesting sort of point. And sort of thinking now a little bit about sort of like the, the sort of moving on and, and obviously now with the, the COVID vulnerability rating framework that you've got, how can you work with, with other banks, including those high street lenders and everyone else, to, to really sort of improve the solutions for everybody? Yeah, so so we're working with banks. Um, so in the UK, we're, we're exclusive with Oak North Bank. Um, but outside the UK, we're working with other banks um, on the COVID vulnerability rating framework. And one of the things that we do, so we've got for our existing clients as platform clients, um, we're doing the full analysis of all of their book because obviously we have all their borrowers on our platform and so on. Um, so that's one thing. But for we found that for some other banks that weren't previously Oak North customers, um, we're able to do the CVR analysis on an anonymized basis. So they give us an anonymized list of borrowers with a very small subset of data points about each borrower. And we're able to direct their attention to particular areas of their book that are vulnerable um, and, and so they can prioritize their response. And that's been very powerful actually. And it's, you know, it's, it's been um, very central to the sort of huge uh, surge in momentum we're having in the US, for example, um, because we're able to help some very big banks. 
who, as you say, big banks like, like governments are not really set up to respond rapidly. And they, they're all trying to do their best. My sort of operating theory around these is that all of these organizations, and I'm sure NetWest is the same, the people are trying as best they can to respond positively in the situation. There's a lot of institutional disruption caused by having to work from home and all that kind of stuff. And then on top of that, you know, these big organizations aren't good at adopting new programs or setting up new systems, et cetera, and they're moving as fast as they can. So one of the things that we're able to do is because we're able to be a little more nimble, we can operate sort of alongside of existing systems they have, do the analysis um, to highlight borrowers who might be at risk, and then they can target those for, for additional um, scrutiny and so on and additional assistance. And that's been very powerful. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. So obviously, you've, as you said, you know, you've got this differentiation between Oak North Platform and the Oak North Bank in the UK. Mm -hmm. Has that given you a, a challenge in the UK because people see you as a bank and therefore, you know, do they, do they want to work with the platform? Do they not want to work for the platform? How, what's the sort of dynamics in play there? Yeah, so I mean, it's been very helpful for us, actually, you know, in, in I think, in a number of different ways. Firstly, like, when I go and speak to banks and regulators around the world, um, they know that we run a licensed bank in the UK, we understand their issues, um, we understand, you know, how regulations work, obviously, they, they differ from place to place, but we broadly speaking, know what's involved in running a regulated institution. And so these things really, really help us. And it also means that we've got um, a kind of deep personal experience of the problem that fintechs often kind of don't have. So fintechs often, you know, they, they need a partner to kind of work with them. Um, whereas obviously we work with partners, but we, we have our own bank. And so we're able to sort of, we, we experience things firsthand through that mechanism. And I think that's really helped us. And then in the UK, obviously, the bank itself has been such a success story, and we're very grateful for that. Um, but that has really helped, you know, on both in terms of our international expansion as a platform business, because we've got a sort of poster child bank um, that everyone wants to talk to us about. But then also, it's just a, you know, it's a very successful bank. And so it's very easy for us, for example, if we want to get um, you know, clients who are happy with our service to go and talk to a client. That's very easy for us. Yeah, it's a really interesting position. Um, obviously, I'm conscious of not taking up too much of your time because you, you have a bank to run. Um, but, you know, so for the final sort of thought, you know, as difficult as it is to predict the future at any point at this moment in time, what, what do you think is, is next going to happen uh, within the, the sort of the lending sphere and, you know, and how is Oak North going to cope with that moving forwards? So, from my perspective, I think there's a, you know, this, this is a sort of watershed moment. So I think this moment of banks realizing that the way they were doing things for such a long time, I think everyone knew it was broken, but I think this is a real watershed moment where everyone has to face up to the fact that this kind of slow bureaucratic approach was, was not fit for purpose, either from the borrower's perspective, but also from the perspective of protecting yourself from credit risk. And I think, you know, this thing of having to re-underwrite your book based on external data, based on new information, respond more rapidly. I think that's a, that's a big change and it'll take a long time to fully play its way through the financial system. But I think that's a, that change is here to stay. And I think we'll, we'll see a data-driven approach, a much more forward-looking um, approach to this lending. My hope is that, um, you know, this underserved segment of SMEs don't continue to be overlooked by banks and that globally banks are are able to you know offer them a better service because you know we feel really strongly that they're they're essential to the recovery post crisis fantastic that sounds uh, hope hopefully as we all hope there is going to be a, a bright future moving forward with this as well um so we've come to the end of the time there i wanted to say thank you very much sean for taking the time out to, to speak with us and uh, thank you very much for your comments thank you very much it's been great